Dear friends, welcome to yet another installment of Orbital Geek. In this video, we are going to explore the fascinating universe of quantum computers, machines that have the potential to transform reality as we know it. Get ready to discover the power of these devices, which could be the most significant, risky, and unpredictable invention of our time. We will travel from the ancient Antikythera mechanism to today's quantum supercomputers by IBM, capable of performing unimaginable calculations. But are we prepared for the risks and possibilities of this revolutionary technology? The quantum technology race between the United States and China is just beginning, and you won't want to miss a single detail. So, are we going to decipher the mysteries of qubits, or will we face the consequences? Watch until the end to find out. Your likes and comments are very important to us. They help the algorithm recommend our video to more people, which is essential for the growth of our channel, especially now that we are starting out. If you can, leave a comment, even if it's just a simple hello. Your participation makes all the difference. Let's begin. Okay, Marvel's Ant-Man may have some questionable physics, but one thing Professor Pym gets right is that the smaller things get, the weirder the laws of physics governing them become. This is important to keep in mind as we move forward. You've probably seen a quantum computer before. It looks pretty strange, more like a cross between a golden lamp and a giant squid than anything we normally associate with a computer. But that's because our current perspective is a bit limited. This is also a computer, in fact, the first computer, the very first one. It was found at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and dates back to ancient Greece. It's known as the Antikythera mechanism. It was used to predict the movements of the sun, moon and earth. It could predict a solar eclipse decades in advance, just as we can today. And this computer also looks pretty strange. Although these gleaming golden gearworks you're seeing are just artistic recreations, the real artifact is actually a collection of fragments encrusted with thousands of years worth of ocean grime. Computing machines have taken many forms over the centuries that humanity has utilized them. In that sense, the quantum computer can be seen as the next phase of evolution. However, in many other respects, it is something entirely new. Modern computers as we know them are defined by bits. A bit is the smallest unit of data that a computer can process and store. Bits are the building blocks of every piece of digital information you've ever experienced. A bit always exists in one of two states, like a switch. That's why we say computers use binary language. The state of each bit is typically represented by one or zero, but it could also be represented by on or off, up or down, left or right, as long as each bit maintains one of two possible values. That's binary computing. The physical manifestation of a bit is called a transistor. It works as an electronic switch and again can exist in one of two possible states, on and off. So the more physical transistors you have, the more bits of information you can process at once which is an oversimplification, but it helps to understand. That's why we're constantly trying to make these transistors smaller over time, so we can pack more of them into ever smaller devices. This old 1960s desktop calculator used 250 transistors. A current model iPhone has 19 billion transistors in just its main processor chip alone. To achieve this, we've shrunk the width of the transistor down to just three nanometers across. This is incredibly tiny, just a bit wider than a strand of human DNA, which is 2.5 nanometers. Transistors may possibly shrink to one nanometer wide by the end of this decade. There is a physical limit to how small they can get, but no matter how tiny you make a transistor, it's still limited by the binary nature of the bit. It can only be in one of two states. And that's where quantum computers come in. A quantum computer uses its own unit of data measurement called a qubit. These qubits can get quite tricky because while they can represent ones and zeros like traditional bits, they can also represent one and zero simultaneously. They're not binary, and that ability gives them the potential to store far more information than traditional bits. The physical manifestation of a qubit is achieved by manipulating the spin state of subatomic particles, like protons or electrons, making them spin up and down or left and right, creating two distinct states, their one and zero. However, quantum mechanics allows these subatomic particles to exist in multiple states at the same time, so they can be spinning in all directions simultaneously. Remember, the smaller things get, the weirder the rules governing them become. 
Here's how this works. If you combine two bits, each bit will represent either one or zero. So no matter the combination, you'll have two bits worth of information. But when you combine two qubits, you get the equivalent of four bits of information. This happens because there are four possible combinations of one and zero, since each qubit can be both values at the same time. So rather than just one and zero, the pair could also be zero and one, or one and one, or zero and zero, all at once. If this is starting to sound familiar, it's probably because you're either already a quantum physicist, or you've heard of the thought experiment called Schrödinger's cat. Schrödinger's basic idea is that you could put a cat in a box, along with something that could potentially kill it, like a vial of poison, and then seal the box. It's a thought experiment. No one actually put a cat in a box with poison, at least not that we know of. Now, while there's no way to know what happened inside the box, we have no evidence to suggest the cat is either dead or alive. Maybe it drank the poison, maybe it didn't. My cat eats plastic but refuses to eat chicken. They're unpredictable creatures. While we have no observable way to predict the cat's fate, it can be considered to be simultaneously dead and alive at the same time. This is called quantum superposition, and it's a state that our qubits can exist in. It's two potential outcomes occurring simultaneously. The trick here is that the moment you open the box and verify the cat's state, that superposition collapses back down to binary. The cat will either be dead or alive. The same applies to qubits. They eventually have to pick a side and resolve to either a one or a zero. But that time spent in superposition allows the quantum computer to explore a vast network of potential combinations before arriving at a final answer. It's this superposition where the quantum computer derives its power. When you start adding up all the potential values from the superpositions of multiple qubits working together, you start getting some pretty staggering numbers. Remember when we said that two qubits could store four possible values, making them equivalent to four standard bits? Well, combine just 20 qubits, and you'd produce over one million potential values. The largest quantum computer that exists today that we know of was built by IBM, and has over 1,000 qubits of processing power. In a decade, IBM expects that number to grow to 100,000 qubits. Now, what does this mean for us? The first thing to understand is that quantum computers aren't just a better version of the computers we use today. They're less an evolution and more like an entirely new mode of transportation. Quantum computers can take us to places we've never visited before. In the same way, a boat can take you places a car can't. But a boat isn't an upgrade or replacement for a car. So quantum computing isn't going to replace 99% of the workloads run on today's supercomputers, and you definitely won't have a quantum computer in your personal device lineup. The simplest reason for this is that for a quantum chip full of qubits to work properly, it must be kept at temperatures as close as possible to absolute zero. That's the coldest temperature that can exist. It's colder than the vacuum of space. So to operate a quantum computer, you need the world's most powerful fridge. And even with the necessary cooling system in place, today's quantum computers can only operate for about a second before the qubits lose their superposition state. The second problem is a bit trickier to understand, but in simple terms, quantum computers tend to make mistakes quite frequently. This is weird because most of us aren't used to computers making mistakes. Imagine if your calculator occasionally gave you the wrong answer. Today's quantum computers have error rates ranging from 1 in 10 in the worst case to 1 in 1,000 in the best case. It's estimated that for a quantum computer to really be practical, the error rate needs to be reduced to at least 1 in a million. This is due to the inherently unstable nature of qubits and their superpositions. Each individual qubit is inherently unstable by itself, and when you start combining multiple qubits, that instability only compounds. This means the more powerful your quantum computer is, the more likely it is to make a mistake. With great power comes great instability. But even considering that unpredictability, today's quantum computers are still able to solve math problems in a matter of seconds that would take a conventional computer thousands of years to complete. This really has the potential to become a major issue. But is it something we should be worrying about? Most iPhone users probably didn't see it, but in February 2024, Apple announced that iMessage had been updated with post-quantum security. This means even a sophisticated quantum computer attack 
wouldn't be able to brute force hack your iMessage account, which is good news. This also shows Apple is taking the quantum hacking concerns seriously, and Apple is one of the pioneers in this shift toward quantum-resistant cryptography. It indicates there are likely many online services you use that still haven't adopted these measures. This includes email, bank accounts, cloud storage, even cryptocurrency wallets like Bitcoin, which are built on cryptography. It's in the name. Those private keys can be brute forced by quantum computers. One of the biggest issues we're facing right now is that the race toward quantum supremacy is not being led by the United States. This is an area where China has taken an early lead. They have the most powerful and stable quantum computers. In 2020, then-President Donald Trump announced the US government would spend $1 billion per year on quantum computing in America. By 2022, the Chinese Communist Party had committed $15 billion per year to their own quantum development, which is a bit terrifying. But is there really anything any of us regular folks can actually do about it? Well, not really. But it may be worth keeping an eye on what services you use that are updating to post-quantum cryptography. If this is something you're concerned about, then it may be prudent to consider switching to services with higher levels of encryption. It's not a fun topic to think about, but this is the world we live in now. Let's think about something exciting. The potential for quantum computers to do incredible things. Things so amazing they could completely alter the course of human history, taking us to a utopian future, like something out of the Star Trek science fiction series. Something that until now has only been imagined. If there's one thing our current computer systems really need, it's the ability to understand nature and the physical world. Traditionally, computers have been abysmal at grasping crucial concepts like biology and meteorology, for instance. We haven't been able to cure cancer because we still don't fully understand its nature. 20 years ago, scientists managed to map the human genome with the help of the supercomputers of that era. It was an incredible achievement, but even with far more powerful machines available today, we're still struggling to make meaningful advances in the field of medical science. One of the biggest challenges here is that the forces of nature, like diseases and viruses, also operate at the quantum level, just like qubits do. This means they have their own superpositions, where the subatomic particles within viruses exist in multiple states simultaneously. Just like in Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, there is no definitive answer until the box is opened. And when it comes to understanding the nature of life, the universe and everything, we need to be able to explore nature on its own level, from the atoms that form the universe. Nature operates at the quantum scale, and that's where we need to go to finally comprehend it. We haven't gotten there yet. It may happen within our lifetime, or it may not. But for the first time in three billion years of life on Earth, we're tantalizingly close to deciphering all those mysteries, and that alone is already something incredible to witness. The quantum revolution is coming, and while we are still in the early stages, its widespread proliferation will transform our basic understanding of nature and the universe. The ability of quantum computers to operate in quantum superpositions and explore an infinity of possibilities all at once makes them extremely powerful. This technology has the potential to unlock the doors to curing disease, accurately predicting weather, and even rewriting the laws of physics. However, the inherent errors and instabilities of qubits represent critical challenges to overcome. The rise of China as a quantum superpower is concerning, especially due to the implications of widespread cryptography breaking. But do the benefits outweigh the risks? Will we be prepared to face the dilemmas of quantum computing? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to turn on notifications for videos like this one.